Howdy guys, Mac Double Tap. I want to talk about ballistics. I'm going to redo this video because the way the timing was off in the other one, it just really uh, was driving me insane. And I corrected uh, some transposition of numbers I did with 45. Uh, but we're going to talk about knockdown power. Uh, I'm sure this video will be slightly different than the other one. I'm not going to get everything I said in the other one because I don't rehearse my stuff. Most people know that. Uh, we are going to talk about the uh, myth of not gun, knockdown power in handguns. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, the reality is, let's talk about what knockdown power is. Uh, most commonly referred to as knockdown power or stopping power. This is a bullet's ability to stop, knock down, or one shot stop an, a human being. Uh, just got done with another video on one shot stop. Uh, as far as getting the PowerPoint put together uh, so we're going to talk about that in the next video it's going to be 302 because it's really related to this one but uh, this is defined on the internet as the ability of a firearm to cause penetrating ballistic energy to a target human or animal enough to incapacitate the target where it stands this contrasts with lethality in that it pertains only to a weapon's ability to incapacitate quickly regardless of whether death is ultimately ensued some theories of stopping power involve concepts such as momentum transfer and hydrostatic shock. Well, there was a disagreement regarding the importance of these effects. That's the uh, cut and paste I took off the internet. Um, but if you notice in there, it said theories. Yes, theories. Because there is no standard of measuring knockdown or stopping power. Uh, however, I'm going to take a number of these different theories and prove that comments I make in Ballistics 201 that all handgun calibers are basically the same with modern ammunition. Uh, one of the big fights and arguments when I said that was, oh my god, my 40 and my 45 and the 9mm, and at the end of the day, they all cut basically the same hole. We're going to get into that. Uh, let's talk about muzzle energy. 9mm and, and I should have put what loads went with this, but I didn't. Uh, but 9 millimeter, basically 300 and foot, 350 foot-pounds of energy. Uh, 40 Smith & Wesson, standard load was running 424. 357 SIG was running 475. 45 ACP running right around 400 foot-pounds. And because the 10 millimeter guys just come out of the woodwork and were mad that I didn't include a 10 millimeter, we're gonna include a 10 millimeter. 650 foot-pounds of muzzle energy. Uh, it really, to compare it, let's go to an air gun, BB gun, 32 foot-pounds of energy. And then let's go up into the 223 runs about 1,325 foot-pounds of energy, or muzzle energy. So, you got like 7.62 by 39, now we're up over 1,500 foot-pounds of energy. Take 308, now we're over 2,500 foot-pounds of energy. And the whole point in this is that there's only 300 foot-pounds of energy that separate all the pistol calibers. Uh, there's 675 foot-pounds between the big and bad 10 millimeter combat handgun caliber and the littlest of the combat rifle calibers in the 223. So everybody's arguing over pistols when there's 300 foot-pounds separate them. And, I, and I've said this before, if you carry a handgun when there's a 0 to 1% chance that you're going to get in a gunfight, if there's a better chance than that you're getting in a gunfight, I suggest you take a rifle. Rifles are much more effective than killing people. Unfortunately, if you're going to walk around the streets with your M4 strapped to your back, you're going to draw attention to yourself, everybody. So that's why that doesn't happen. You know, pistols are something you carry when there's virtually no chance you're going to get in a gunfight. But there's only 300 foot-pounds that separate them in the, this ammunition set that I used. Uh, now we're going to look at momentum transfer for a minute. I'd love to, but I can't find any good data on it. There are a number of articles on how to calculate it. Plenty of people talk about it, but with most of the knockdown power argument, there's no real data or scientific theory to back any of it up. Uh, now, I understand somebody's going to go out there and find a data set and throw it on. Uh, yeah, I found a whole pile of them. Uh, I get it. 
the problem with the different data sets that I found is all of them were measured with vastly different standards and came to vastly different conclusions. Uh, so if you're going to pick your favorite, favorite data set to argue for your caliber, skip it. Uh, if no matter what data set you find, I'll throw I, I can give you 15 more that com come to completely different conclusions. That's why I'm not going to talk about it. There is no standard for measuring it. If there was a standard for measuring it, we'd use it, but there's not. Everybody does it a different way. So momentum transfer is kind of a useless concept as far as I'm concerned. It, 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 it's arguing about ghosts and goblins. Nobody can prove any of it. Uh, let's talk about hydrostatic shock, which is a favorite in the mock down power group. Uh, this is a cut and paste, and I don't even remember from where now. I made, I actually made this PowerPoint several weeks ago at this point. Uh, in self-defense, military, and law enforcement communities, opinions vary regarding the importance of a remote wounding effects in ammunitions and an ammunition design and selection. In his book, The Hostage Rescuers, Leroy Thompson discusses the importance of hydrostatic shock in choosing a specific design of 357 Magnum or 9x19 Parabellum bullets. And an armed and female, Paxton Quigley explains that hydrostatic shock is a real source of stopping power. Jim Carmichael, who served, served as the shooting editor for Outdoor Life magazine for over 25 years, believes that hydrostatic shock is important to a more immediate disabling effect. And it's a key difference between the performance of a 38 Special and 357 Magnum hollow point bullets. In the search for an effective police handgun, Alan Bristow describes that police departments recognize the importance of hydrostatic shock when choosing ammunition. Yet again, a research group at West Point suggests that handgun loads with at least 500 foot-pounds of energy or 680 joules uh, and 12 inches of penetration is what's needed to make a handgun an effective stopping caliber or effective stopping bullet. 500 foot-pounds of energy seems to be the key. Uh, that, re that 500 foot-pounds has become the benchmark. It was the standard for FBI. It, I mean, it, it, they did a lot of high-end research in that study and come up to the point that if you're not getting to 500 foot-pounds of energy, then you are a substandard caliber. Let's stop there for a second. A research group at West Point, 500 foot-pounds of energy. 12 inches of penetration. Let's go back and look at these. By that standard, only the 10 millimeter covers. And I know the 10 millimeter jaws are jumping up and going, yeah, he admitted it. Slow down. Uh, that was with these loads. And I'm going to qualify this into saying every one of them loads when I found them was the biggest bullet, the standard. Uh, you know, for the 9mm, it was 147 grain. For the 40 and Smith and Wesson, I believe that was 180 grain. 45 ACP was 230 grain. Uh, 125 grain, maybe, for the 357 SIG. 10mm, I don't know what the biggest bull with 10mm is off the top of my head. Uh, I think it was 200 grain. <clears throat> so, them 10mm was the standard that West Point came up with. But the military doesn't use 10 millimeter. Just found that interesting. They never have used 10 millimeter. Uh, anyway. A number of law enforcement military agencies have adopted the 5.7 by 28 cartridge. This is the FN that runs in the P90 and the 5.7 pistol, which was handy for making a pistol slash subgun caliber that you know the ammunition was interchangeable between the guns it is reputed to cause considerable hydrostatic shock the the agencies that have adopted it are the navy seals uh, federal protective services branch of ice in contrast some defense contractors law enforcement analysts and military analysts say that hydrostatic shock is an unimportant factor when selecting cartridges for a particular use because any incapacitating effect it may have on a target is difficult to measure and inconsistent from one individual to the next. This is in contrast to factors such as proper shot placement, massive blood loss, 
which are almost always eventually incapacitating for near, nearly every individual. So, what that saying is what I've been saying all along. Shot placement is the key. Nearly impossible nearly impossible to measure and inconsistent from one person to the next. Just giving you a second to read that because again this was a cut and paste. Now we're going to talk about size. Oh my god. I am so sick and tired of hearing about well I want that big massive blah blah blah. Holy Man, you guys are nothing if not if not persistent when it comes to that. Uh, nine millimeter, forty Smith and Weston, three fifty seven Sig, forty five ten millimeter, hundred and forty seven grain nine millimeter round, two hundred grain forty Smith and Weston round, hundred and fifty grain Sig round, three fifty seven Sig round, two hundred and thirty grain forty five round, and ten millimeters running two hundred grain bullet. So there was our respective foot-pounds of energy. So we see the 40 Smith & Wesson running the same grain bullet as the 10 millimeter is running what 125, 225 less foot-pounds of energy. It's a lot, same bullet. Uh, 9 millimeter and 357 SIG. Three grains separating the bullets. Uh, 125 foot pounds of energy. Then you got the big dog. Big dog. 230 grain, 45 round. How could it possibly have less foot pounds of muzzle energy than a 10 millimeter with 30 less grains of bullet? How's that possible? Well, if it ain't size that matters, what is it? Let's look at the 5.7 by 28. 23 grain bullet standard load. 23 grain bullet. That's like 10%, 90% smaller than the 45. 10% of the bullet weight, right? But it's achieving the exact same muzzle energy. How is that possible, boys and girls? Show you out. Uh, muzzle velocity. That 147 grain, <coughs> excuse me, 147 grain, 350 foot pound of energy, 9 millimeter round was running at 990 feet per second. Uh, 180 grain. Now the reason those are asterisked up there is these are golden sabers. This data came from Remington's website, so that's why we're doing these three first. Uh, those are the relative speeds to the energy that those specific rounds produced. Uh, they don't make a 200 grain 40 Smith & Wesson Golden Sabre on their website so for the information for the 40 Smith & Wesson was lowered here for the sake of equal comparison for the same type of ammunition as best they could possible. Uh, 357 SIG was federal premium ammunition. Uh, pumped up the energy a little bit, a little bit, 488, now we're climbing up on that 500 foot-pounds, but notice it's running at 1,200 feet per second. Uh, Didn't mean to do that. Uh, 10 millimeter, 1,300 feet per second. Hmm. 200 grain bullet, 1,300 feet per second, is running at 16, 650 foot-pounds of energy. Now that little ass 28, uh, 23 caliber round, 23 grain round out of the 5.7 by 28, getting that 400 foot pounds actually higher than the Remington Golden Saber, which is a law enforcement standard for 45. Uh, I don't think there's much arguing that. I mean, I know there's other agencies that use, but the bonded Golden Saber is top of the line in military er, in law enforcement. Uh, what do we notice there? The faster the bullets are going, the more energy they have. 
mass times acceleration squared. Hmm. Uh, 10 millimeter was double tap ammunition, and then the uh, 5.7 by 28 was not a hollow point. It was full metal jacket round. So let's see if we can make all of these rounds hit that magic 500 foot pounds of energy. Uh, we know the 10 millimeter contain that mythical 500 foot pounds of energy. So what about the others? 9 millimeter. 115 grain jacketed hollow point plus P plus running at 1430 seconds, 519 foot pounds of energy. And I'm gonna I'm gonna just say this right now. You can find in my older videos <coughs> where I was running 147 grain golden sabers out of my out of my Glocks forever, forever and ever and ever and ever. I kind of need to thank you guys for starting this. Uh, this ballistic conversation and making me do the research that I have done because now I just bought 10,000 uh, bullets to sit down and start loading uh, 115 grain jacket of hollow points I'm gonna match that speed and I'm gonna be running 500 foot-pounds of energy out of my 9 millimeter uh, but I really do you know I have never claimed to be the end-all catch-all. I've never claimed that I know everything. I've got into this argument to make this argument logical and not so much that I was claiming that I knew everything there was to know about everything because I've never done that. But what I was claiming is I was tired of all the bullshit that went with it, all the myths and the magic. And that's what I was trying to get rid of was, you know, yeah, the big hole the 45 makes, but we'll get into that in a minute. Anyway, so I do need to thank you guys because through my research for these videos, that's what a discussion is. We all learn together, and that's what's happened with me. I now run 115 grain bullets at 1,430 feet per second. That is why I put it on a chronograph till I got it knocked down, figured out the load. Now I'm loading my own. Like I said, just bought 10,000 rounds to sit down and load up. That'll keep me busy for an hour or two. And uh, we're going to move on. But if we can get 9 millimeter to 500 foot-pounds, pretty much get anybody there, right? 40 Smith & Wesson, 155 grain jacketed hollow point, running at 1,200 feet per second, you get right at 500 pounds. Now, somebody's going to say, well, why not do the 200 grain bullet and get up to that 650 like they do in the 10 millimeter. The 40 is the 10 millimeter short. Hence the 40 S and W short and weak. You dumb down the 10 millimeter. You don't give it as much casing capacity to put powder, therefore you cannot obtain the speeds out of a 40 Smith and Wesson that you're going out of, going to out of a 10 millimeter. You can't do it. Chamber pressure becomes unsafe. 357 SIG, no shock here. Being a 357 SIG and a 9mm are the same damn bullet. If you run them at the same speeds, you obtain the same muzzle energy. So, in my world, the way I look at things, this just made no reason in the world to ever run a 357 SIG. Why would you do it? If I can run a 9mm at the exact same speeds and the exact same bullet with the exact same energy, why would I want to give up two rounds? Or three or whatever. Yeah, I think 357 SIG and uh, 31 is 15 rounds. 9mm doing the exact same thing as 17 rounds. But I'm not trying to start a war with you 357 SIG guys. I'm sure I just did. Uh, 45 ACP. We've been all told for 100,000 years that that 230 grain bullet was the nut. As it turns out, if you want to make the 45 a more effective caliber, drop the weight of the bullet, speed it up, you get over 500 foot-pounds of energy. Uh, it appears that a lighter bullet moving it faster is the answer to achieving that magic number now, doesn't it? Uh... And when you think about the reality of a 115 grain or a 200 grain bullet, there's not that much difference. So the answer to getting that energy you need 
in all cases is to throw that bullet out of the barrel faster. Now, because of casing capacities, you can't take those big bullets and run them at those speed at the speeds needed. So you take that little bit lower, smaller bullet, throw it faster, pump your muzzle energy up. Uh, now, let's talk about the massive 45 round out over that little ass 9mm. Bullet diameter of a 45 ACP is 4 point, point four five one thousandths of an inch. The bullet diameter of a 9mm is 0.355 thousandths of an inch. That means the difference in diameter is 0 0.093 thousandths of an inch. Now here's a quick math question for you. What amount of drugs would you have to consume over what period of time to believe that 0 0.093 thousandths is a massive size difference? It's horseshit. It's not. 93 thousandths. It's roughly the thickness of your finger now, I think. It, nothing. Uh, but if you load to 9 millimeter to plus, per, plus P plus, you get the same energy, but you gain the recoil, so you might as well just carry the bigger caliber. Uh, no. If you can obtain the same energy with comparable recoil, but have more bullets in the magazine, why wouldn't you? In Ballistics 101 and 201, we have showed that there is little or no difference in modern handgun bullets. And here we have showed that each and every one of these single rounds is capable of taining that magical 500 foot-pounds of energy that the West Pointers came up with. And the beloved FBI study that everyone throws out there as law. Why wouldn't you carry the handgun that has the highest capacity? Give me an argument that makes any kind of sense of why you would want to carry less bullets. I, other than liberals, I'm not trying to go down the road of, you don't need more than eight bullets to kill a deer. I'm not talking about killing deer. When I want to hunt deer, I hunt them with a, well, I do actually hunt with a handgun more often than not, but, you know, I'll take a rifle. Uh Back to my original point, handgun rounds in any caliber suck in a gunfight. Even the smallest combat rifle rounds have damn near three times the energy of that magical 300 or 500 foot pounds. So the answer is if you know you might be getting into a gunfight and you only bring a handgun, you're an idiot. You carry a handgun when there's little or no chance you will need it. If you think you're going to need a gun, bring a rifle. In closing, Knockdown power and stopping power is related to the physical properties of the bullet and the effect it has on its target. But the issue is complicated and not easily studied. Critics contend the importance of the one-shot stop statistics is overstated, pointing out that most gun encounters do not involve shoot once and see how the target reacts situations. Uh, we train for this all the time. Do you train to shoot at your target and then look and see how it reacted or do you train to shoot double taps or triple taps uh, I can tell you from my personal ballistic studies when we did what we did I came to the conclusion that three shots was what I need to do and I started training accordingly uh, stopping is usually caused by the force of the bullet especially in the, in, in the case of handgun and rifle bullets, is, I'm sorry, is not usually caused by the force of the bullet, but by the damaging effects of that bullet, which are typically a loss of blood, and with it, blood pressure. More immediate effects can result when a bullet damages parts of the central nervous system, such as the spine or brain. At the end of the day, there are only four par parts of the body that will stop an attacker, if you put a bullet in it. The heart, the lungs, the liver, and the central nervous system. That's it. Nothing else matters. Heart, lungs, liver, central nervous system. You're not going to have the desired effect on a bad guy by shooting them in the leg, arm, or other relevant body parts. The heart, lungs, liver, CNS is the only thing capable of the magical one-stop th shot. 
which we're going to talk about that in the other video. No matter what caliber was used and whatever one shot stop, I will bet you a lot of money. And I'll bet you a lot more money now that I've done some more research on this. That one or more of those critical areas was struck by the round. As so I've said over and over and over and over and over and over and over, caliber is not important as shot placement or multiple shots on target. This is one last thought for this video. Bella Twin, an Indian girl, and her friend Dave Arger were hunting grouse near Lesser Slave Lake in northern Alberta, Canada. They were walking a cut line that had been made for oil exploration when they saw a large grizzly fall in the same survey line toward them. If they ran, the bear would probably notice them and might give chase. So they went, sat down in a brush pile and hoped that the bear would pass by without trouble. But when the bear came much too close, and when that big boar was only a few yards away, Bella Twin shot him in the side of the head. The bear dropped, kicked, then laced there. That bear killed in 1953 was a world record, world record grizzly for several years and still is very high in the records list today. The caliber that Miss Twin killed the world record grizzly bear in a single one-shot stop through the massive skull bone and a grizzly bear's head? 22 long rifle. One shot in the central nervous system. A Mac double tap shooting. Uh, appreciate you guys watching. Please like, share, subscribe, and uh, train. Uh, and you guys have seen my logo before, but tactics, training, mindset, and technique. It does not say, and I'm not saying my logo's all that in a bag of chips, but it doesn't say caliber. But uh, tactics, training, mindset, and technique. Those are the things that are going to help you win a gunfight. Caliber or whose gun you're carrying, doesn't matter. Appreciate you guys watching. We'll see you next time.